Hello everyone. We begin the year with a very special workshop by Bradford Hansen Smith. Uh, Brad is a sculptor and, uh, and a researcher. Uh, inspired by the work of Hazel Henderson and Buckminster Fuller, uh, Brad developed a process of folding, of folding the compressed sphere, the circle. So if you want to follow the workshop, I recommend that you have um, paper plates, in fact, a bit larger and thinner paper plates, very simple ones, uh, some kind of a folding implement, if you, if you, can, have, you can have one, simple hairpins, like these, simple hairpins, and possibly a bit of masking tape. Yeah. So Brad will take us on a journey of discovery uh, and talks, of course, about the unity of everything through his discoveries on the, on the folded, on the compressed sphere, which is the circle. Thank you so much and hope you enjoy uh, our first uh, podcast of uh, 2022. Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks, the collaboration with the New Art School and Zendidax podcast. Our guest today is Bradford Hansen Smith. Welcome, Brad. Thank you, Lutex. It's, um, it's, it's interesting being here. It's fantastic to have you here. Fantastic. So tell us about you and your fantastic work. Um, well, Rather than telling you about me, I'd rather tell you what I do. Um, and what I do is I fold circles. And that, um, that doesn't mean a lot to most people because we fold squares. And we, we're, we're used to doing everything with a 90 degree angle. You know, when we get a origami, what does origami do? That's folding paper. So origami people take a rectangle. First thing they do is they divide it into a square because then it gives them two lines of symmetry, mm. uh, two diagonals. It gives them two diameters for the circle that the square was cut from. That's the symmetry is the circle. So it's, it's a very different headset. I, I, when I talk with people and they say, what do you do? And I say, full circles. I can see in their mind, they have no idea what I'm talking about because we don't fold circles, we fold squares. And we've, we've, we're living in this dichotomy um, where we separate things out in terms of opposites, dualities, this and that, other or, up and down, square, circle, polygons, circle. First thing I learned when I was in first grade, circles and polygons. In the second grade, where'd the circles go? We're all into polygons. So we only use circles for, for zero, nothing, writing, numbers. Um, and we use it metaphorically for the rest of our lives. So at some point I realized everything in geometry that I was learning traced back to the compass is straight edge. And um, that led me to, to understanding that it's all in the circle. But because I have an art background and not a math background, I knew that when I drew a circle, it was a picture of a circle. It wasn't a circle. And we don't, we just assume that a circle is this idea in our head. It's a concept. And it's not, it's real. I mean, circles are everywhere in all kinds of shapes or forms. So that tells me the circle is not the pattern. The circle is the shape or the form of where all this stuff comes from. So then fast forward a few years about 25 years, I realized that it's really about unity. And unity is a concept. We have no form of what that looks like. We have no experience. So unity is, is one of these concepts that we 
we hold out there as an ideal that we're going to achieve. We're going to construct probably since the beginning of man. And we had to figure out how to live together as a unit to survive. That's no different than the situation on this planet today. We have to, as a unit planet, figure out how to live together so we are going to survive. And that's survival physically, survival mentally, and survival spiritually. And we don't talk about those things in terms of survival. We're just talking about how we can physically survive and keep our stuff. And so this is a perspective that, that I've pulled out of looking at the circle and folding it and understanding the that it is, I would have to say, a hands-on metaphor for unity, for wholeness. There's so much, I mean, one of the things that, that took me out of the arts and, and beginning to explore geometry at all was the fact that I did not understand what people were talking about. They would say the form of this, the pattern of that, the design of that, you know, I mean, the structure. What are they talking about? Structure, form, design, pattern, style. These did not fit my experience of doing something. And so I thought, if we've got all these different words, they must mean different things. They're not interchangeable. You know, we can't say the design of a rug is the structure of a rug, nor can we say it's the form of a rug. It may be the style of the person who designed that rug, but, you know, there's no clarity in terms of the language we use to, to facilitate observation. Because what we observe, we translate into words and we give it meaning. And if we can give it enough meaning, it has value. And that just, it, it seems backwards to me. That the mind, the mind translates the experience in, into some kind of concept and gives words to the concept. So in tracing things back to the compass and straight edge, aren't we going back to experience? You know, the unity is, is the compass and the straight edge is the experience of directly doing something. So, um, The circle, unity has just pulled me deeper and deeper into the circle as a form of expression of what is structural. And I would break that down and say, that's the triangle. I think most people would understand the triangle is structural. The square is not. The, the square is, has these 90 degree angles and we think it's structural because it doesn't move when we draw it on a piece of paper. It stays there. So that we translate that into an object and build a square and put four of those together and put one on the top and we have a house. And, and I think very quickly, we're getting to the point where we realize this doesn't work anymore. It's not structural. Because when we put those squares together, what do we do to make it stable? We triangulate it. Hmm. And, you know, in some way. So now our architects are beginning to realize if we triangulate things from the very beginning, then we can do whatever we want with the form and we know it's structural. And this is what Buckminster Fuller had to offer. You know, get away from your old way of thinking and, and think about things dynamically in terms of the triangle. So 
and this is this is all good stuff to talk about, but what does this mean in terms of the circle? And how do we even approach what we don't what we haven't done before? We don't know. You know, and for me, the circle is a means of one, understanding that what we are told circles are is not true. They're much more than that. Euclid says infinite number of points all the same distance from one point. We still define it that way in the dictionary. Does anybody draw a circle point by point by point? No. It describes how a compass works. Put center, and then you draw a line around it. Okay. Uh, without going into that, that's a, a misobservation about what a compass does. We just want, we just are using that tool for what we want to do with it, which is draw a circle. And then intellectually, we begin to define it by points and lines. So um, there's, there's a whole case that you can build up century by century as to why we don't fold circles, that it's just an image that we draw. Um, and we've developed a system around the square and, and the 90 degree angle. So that seems to be a good place to start, the 90 degree angle. So, Lefters, I understand you have some paper plates in front of you. Oh yes, I do. Let me just uh, switch the camera. <laughs> um, I, I would like you to just fold one of those one of those circles. Okay, good. Now, the, the ridges sometimes bother people and you can flatten those out before you fold or not. I don't, you know, I don't mind them being there um, because they will get flattened out as you fold more and crease more. Um, and I find a lot of times when I get into complex forms and shapes, those ridges become part of the the, the surface interest on um, the fact that they're there. So anyway, we don't, we don't want to consider those. We're just looking at a circle with a crease. So that was not there before you folded it. Absolutely. What else is there that was before you folded it? Do, do tell. What's that? Uh, do tell me. Please oh, tell me. What's that? What, what, what is it? Tell me. Well, I want to hear what your observations are about what it, you see now that was not there before you folded. It's a two half circles. Okay. That's that's what we call them, but it's still a whole circle, isn't it? Yes. Okay, so more correctly, you could say that it's divided into two parts or two halves. Yes. Um, see, and, and this is where observation is important. And, and I think that we don't observe what we do. We observe what we think we have done. So the first response is we folded the circle into, into two halves. That we can understand. We now have points. How many points are there? Uh, that create, that make up the line? Yeah. Two points. Two points. So now we have points we didn't have. We have points, two points in the line. We in fact have four points in a line, but we'll get into that in a minute. Um, 
in that fold in half. In half. Well, what else do you see? No, don't fold. Just okay. What what else do you see in folding it in half? See, this is getting at what did you do to fold it in half? How did you do it? Uh, like you have demonstrated in your video, I have uh, for, uh, lined up the outer edges. Yeah. And uh, made sure that they are aligned. And, you, and you've said that the rest of the edge will align by itself. Yeah. Um, now, I, when I first started folding circles, that's what I did. I lined up the edges and I creased them. That was the obvious thing to do. And if if the edges weren't in line, then the, and that would not be divided in half. It would not have that beautiful symmetry. Um, so what you, you know, I found that what I was doing at some point, I was actually looking at one part, one point on that circumference and putting it to another point. And when I got those two points together, then my conscious mind went into line up the edge. And it didn't acknowledge the fact that I took two points, I put them together. And over the years, I've had a few students actually tell me that's what they remember they did, taking two points, putting them together. Then they lined up the edges. See, without understanding that if any two points on a circumference are touching exactly, the edge will be in line and it will divide it in half. See, so <clears throat> from the get-go, that's what observation is about. It's about seeing what we do when we do it and not reflecting on the concept after we've done it. Absolutely. And I mean, when you look at, look at any top level athlete, no matter what sport they're dealing in, today, oh, even before we had cameras and could, you know, look at their, their action moment by moment, an athlete would think about what they were doing when they were doing it. That was their feedback. If I'm doing this and it's not working for me, then I've got to do that and it works better. So direct observation of what they do when they're doing it tells them how to improve their game. And we use observation as a word to describe what we see. What do I see? Well, I see the sun's coming up. But what's going on there in terms of my, my seeing that? If, if I don't go into an understanding of, of light and movement and action and how the eye works and, you know, all of that stuff, I have no idea what's going on. I just see the sun coming up. And coming up, well, that means it can go down. So hey, we're back into flat earth, you know, 2D thinking 2,500 years ago. The sun goes up, sun goes down. That's like saying the sun goes around the earth. The earth is the center of the universe. We now know the earth is not the center of the universe. A very small part of an enormously magnificent space out there, which is reflected in the space we carry with us. And there's, there's plenty of theoretical physicists and people who will say it's all interconnected. There's no separation. Everything that I have ever done with that circle over 30 some years of folding, there's been no separation. Everything is all in the same place, the circle. I just see it in multiple forms, but the circle is the same. It hasn't changed. The circle does not change. The folder changes. And that's what observation is about. That's our feedback system 
that allows us to change. And so here is an activity that reflects something about how we learn through observation. So this, this folding, we could spend probably the next three hours talking about all the information that you've just folded in that circle. If we can observe what we really did, putting two points, touching them together, creasing. So we created a ratio of one whole, two parts. One to two. Very first thing that happened. So that tells us that no matter what symmetry we go into, that, that crease, that line of symmetry, that ratio of one to two is principal to everything else that circle will do. There is no exception. We can cut them into squares, we can cut them into pentagons, we can cut them into all kinds of shapes. We can destroy the circle, which is what we normally talk about in geometry. You take a sphere, you cut it in half, and then you draw a picture of the concept of the circle, which is what you have in your mind after you've destroyed the sphere, which is the only form that inherently demonstrates unity. Hmm. So you so saw right off. Geometry, mathematics has developed from destroying unity, the sphere, and drawing pictures of what we think is left, which is the circle, and then truncating the circle into squares and polygons and all the other forms that we use. And without ever realizing what we've done. And so we, have, we now have you know, a, a way of thinking, a logic that is based on destruction, destruction of unity. And we've, we've shot ourselves in the foot and we're limping around trying to figure out how to get unity back. How do we construct unity? We have to get rid of what we have put in place and start from unity and not destroy it not cut it apart. And how that plays out in my mind is you've got unit, you've got the sphere, which is the only form I know of that demonstrates this concept of unity. It's, it's undifferentiated completely. So rather than cutting it apart and destroying that concept, if you take it and compress it down to a flat plane, so you're just taking this sphere, compressing it down to a flat plane, you're getting a circular disk. None of that spherical volume has been touched. It has simply been reformed into a circular disk. So it's still unity. A different form. Mm -hmm. So there again, biggest, biggest difference you can think about. We draw a picture of a circle and call it a unit circle. Or we compress the sphere down to a circular disk and we have circle unity. Two very different places to start from. So with, um, with this disk that you've just folded, you have identified putting two points together and creasing it and getting a line with two points. But in fact, the two points you started with, even though they were unseen, are there. Hmm. So we could then take off in a different direction and make those two marks so that we actually see them anywhere on the circumference. Put those points together and then open it up and then we'll see that we have the two marked points and the two points of the diameter. So we have four points. Four points is a minimum description of a tetrahedron. 
tetrahedron is all triangles. It is structural. That very first fold showed you a, a relationship of four points that is tetrahedral and is structural. So anything after that, I mean, that's, that's, that's principle to that first fold. Principle, I mean, that's a whole nother area that we can get into. What are principles? What do we talk about when we talk about principles? Um, how many subject areas do you know that have principles to go by, to follow, to be successful? All the areas of design have, have principles. The area of design. The, the, yes. The area, <laughs> any area. Yes. There are certain principles that are given. They're, they're like axioms. They're never yes. questioned. And yet, they're just ideas of what we think will make us successful. Ideas that will make things work. That will keep things in line. And they're not the first things that happen. They're just ideas about what we think, about is what is important. So design principles have to do with, what do they have to do with? I'm not a designer. I don't know. But, you know, I have asked mathematicians over the years, what are the principles of mathematics? Most of them can't tell me. A lot of them say, well, arithmetic. Um, we don't know, but we use this word principle to keep people in line. It's a way of control. For me, principle is what happens first. Well, if you want to look at it in terms of education, principal is the guy that runs the school. So you do what he says. Otherwise, you know, you're in trouble. You're in the principal's office and you get scolded. You know. Oh, uh, this is my experience. <laughs> Because you've questioned the principle. <laughs> so, if principle is what happens first, then that first fold that you just made is principle to everything else. So, we can, we can look at and actually say, for myself, I had to say what these principles are. The qualities, the things that happen in that first fold is, one, I started with wholeness, a whole circle. Two, there was movement. That created that that um, created division in a duality, those two halves. That created triangulation in tetrahedra, the structural nature. And Then there was what the effect of all of this is the inner relationship of each part to that movement of the whole. And that, that relationship of part to whole is what directs all the interrelationships between parts. So then it began to make sense okay. We start with a hole, we move it. How do we move it? Well, we can throw it, we can roll it, we can, you know, do all kinds of things with it. But what does the circle tell us it wants to do? This whole thing about folding circles is observing the information that's being generated to know what to do next. It's not my idea. I spent years getting rid of the ideas in my mind of what I wanted to do with the circle to get to the point to where I say, okay, what do you want me to do? So with that, um, with that idea in mind of principle, the whole movement, Division, duality, triangulation, inner relationship to the movement of the whole, and the interrelationship between the parts. 
seem to be qualities of that first movement that were directive to everything else about the circle and about my life. My relationship to unity, my relationship to the whole, my relationship to this concept of wherever it is I came from and what created me and all of this stuff dictates how I'm going to interrelate with all this stuff and all these other people. You know, if, if I'm self-centered, then that's going to that's, that's going to create one dynamics if I see myself as the center of the universe. If, if I see myself as part of the whole, then I relate in a very different way. Because what's more important than, I mean, one part is no more important than any other. It is that each part has its own relationship to the whole. And depending on that consciousness, we then relate with each other or the world around us. So just in my own life, I've realized that, and this goes back to when I was a kid. I can remember I was like six years old or so. And I can remember being out in Southern California where I grew up, lots of sunshine, in the summer, I'm standing on the sidewalk, looking at my shadow, thinking, what an amazing thing. It gets longer, it gets, you know, it moves when I move. Uh, you know, for a six-year-old mind, this was a pretty interesting thing to see. And then I realized there's, there's leaves, shadows of leaves moving on the ground, too. Then I started thinking about, well, what moves the shadows of the leaves. What moves the leaves? The wind. I knew that. But what, what's the wind? What is it moving? What is the movement that makes these things happen? See, and, and I didn't quite think about it with the mind that I've got now. But I thought it was a, with a six-year-old mind, it was like, and I loved to draw and paint when I was that age. So I thought, somebody's moving this. Somebody did this. Somebody made this. And it's beautiful. It's extraordinary. They must have really loved what they were doing because I love what I make things. I love doing that. So that was my first six-year-old thought about God. Somebody that made all this stuff. Then I, eventually I realized he made me too. So here, you know, I'm now in a dilemma because I've got these principles that lead me back to a concept that we call God. And we argue and fight and kill each other about what we think God is and who God is and on whose side he is. And all these ideas and concepts about something we know nothing about. There isn't any religion that can tell you who God is. Without lying to you. Because they don't know. They're going on something that somebody wrote a long time ago or told them, that told them, that told them, and this is what I believe. They are giving me a belief. So I have to then look at that and say, there's a conflict here. I have no problem with the idea of God creating me in the universe. But there seems to be a problem out there with other people. So all of a sudden, I'm seeing my experience, which is real to me, in conflict with everybody else. And everybody else is just giving me ideas, concepts, beliefs. They're not giving me their experience. They can't do that. They can't walk in my shoes. I can't walk in their shoes. But I can go to a deeper level within me and know what my experience is walking in my shoes. And then I have 
what we call an empathy for the other person walking in their shoes because we share the same experience in different forms, in different ways. We share folding the circle, but we all do it differently in the same way. And we come up with different forms. You know, so it's, it's no different than living our lives. I cannot live anybody else's life. But I can deeply go into observing my own life and share that with others. And then as we share deeply, then there's a communication. Otherwise, we're just talking ideas and sharing ideas and beliefs. And beliefs come and go. What I believe now is not what I believed you know, 30 years ago. So to me, folding circles, you're getting the idea, right? Folding circles is, is about life for me because it has opened me up to a way, a perspective that I didn't have before. Intuitively, I did, as that six-year-old watching my shadow, thinking about the wind. I mean, we, we all do that when we're young, to some degree, in our own unique way. We register the world we live in and try to make sense of it. And that doesn't stop. It's not, it's not a problem-solving activity. It's, it's continually observing what we do. And if it doesn't work, we then have a problem. And the problem is go deeper in your observations. Don't try and find a solution. The solution isn't out there. You know, the problem to education today is not in the educational world. They're doing what the majority of people want to do in terms of educating their youth. And they're going by the ideas that they've been told are the best way to do it. The quote, principles of education. And they're not principles, they're just ideas and beliefs. And so, how did I educate myself? How do we educate each other? And allowing for that individual to educate themselves within a collective that supports that idea of education. Mm -hmm. um, I know you're, you're thinking you want to fold some more circles. Let's get on with folding circles, right? Yeah, sure. So <laughs> let's get folding. Um, so you, you can see now that with four points in a line, we, we can go. I mean, you can draw those out and get a trap, or get a uh, kite shape, and then you can go into all the geometry and mathematics and find those relationships in that kite shape that is in that first fold. But um, that aside, how do we know what to do next? What do you think would be the next fold? Uh, maybe join up the other two points together? Um, okay, don't do that. Don't do that yet. Okay. But that, that is one, one way of doing it. Um, can you think of any other? other yes, choose, choose any other random points. Uh, and that, that's another way. But when you look at, at that ratio of one to two, one holds two parts, that is the only thing that we can say about it in terms of the unity, the wholeness of the circle and the movement, which creates two parts. All of the rest of it is about the parts, putting points together, putting two new points together. You know, it's all about parts. But if we go with that ratio, then we realize we have choices. We're going to fold in a ratio of one to two again. So you've got that folded circle. So yeah, fold it in half and keep it in half. No, no just fold it on the crease. No, no, 
fold it on the crease that you've got. Okay, that's where we are right now. We fold it in half. Now, do we have other choices besides folding one point to the other point? Yeah, we can fold it randomly, I guess. Okay. Now, and looking at it randomly, here, let me, when, when we've got circle here, this point can randomly be folded to any other point all the way across to that point. Uh-huh. So it could be any one of these. Now, in terms of symmetry and counting, we all know how to count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, we have just folded it 180 degrees. Yes. So we can fold it another 180 degrees or at any point in between. Yes. You can fold it one, two, three degrees, four degrees, five degrees, all the way to 180. Um, What happened was we first folded it into thirds, right? Two parts, one line of division, three parts. So the tetrahedron of four points was still about thirds. That structural number. So we're going to want to fold it then in thirds, maybe, to be consistent. Okay. This would be in half. That would not be inconsistent, but it would be one of the choices we have. Now, if we're familiar with the clock face, which a lot of people are not anymore, because we look at numbers as they appear one after another individually. Yeah. The digital world has broken up the proportional relationship between things and has just given us pixel by pixel by pixel. This is how we operate now. But the clock face tells us it's really three ways to divide 12. We can divide it into thirds, we can divide it into fourths, and we can divide it into fifths. Three, four, and five. So we have the same thing here. We can divide it into fourths. Or is you know, now don't crease it. Don't, don't crease it. Oh, no. If if you go to where this is one, okay, and this is this is two. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry. This this is this is one and this is three. So you got three. Or you can go one. These are even. So this is actually one over two, yeah. which is three. And this is actually this would be this would be your four, which is you're seeing. One over one, which is four parts. Yeah. And, and then this becomes one and three, which is your five. I, see, this is where numbers are beautiful because they work and they don't work. Mm. They work in a limited form that we use them but they don't work in describing what I do. So I'm going to go through just real quickly with you what this looks like. If we fold it this way, it's just four to, uh, two diameters. Mm. That's flat. There's nothing you can do with that. It's, it's, it's just a flat, which is why four works so well in two-dimensional geometry. Because it's flat, it's not dimensional. When you fold 
if you fold this, so you've got one thing, and you've got to fold this over. Now this, this is pretty rough. And now you've got one and two, and you fold this over. Now this is really uneven. Yes. So then it's up to me to pay attention and to slide things back and forth and get it as even as I can. And then you're going to end up with one, 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 two, three, four, five parts, and you're going to end up with a 510 symmetry, which is your pentagon. Holding it in. I gotta get another circle. Okay. Holding it, sliding it over so that you've got one and two. Yeah. Which is pretty much a direct reflection of that one to two ratio. And you just, just, just sort of push that down to hold that position. Now, you're just doing this by eyeball. This looks even to that. Mm -hmm. So then you're going to turn it over and then put those two endpoints together. Will I fold it now? No, no. I, no, no. Look at, look at both sides. Look yeah. at both sides. Is everything even? Ah. Is circumference even? Ah. That's, tri that's tricky. And your points are even and your edges are even. That's You're going to slide it back and forth. In other words, you're in control of doing something with the circle, but it's telling you whether you're doing it right or not. Whether you're in, whether the first thing we did, it told us right away whether we touch those points together or not. In other words, did you align me or did you not? Yes, it's aligned. Okay. So then when you do this, it's like, did you align me or did you not? Is everything in line? So this is your this is the feedback system. I know what I'm doing. I'm folding it into thirds. Yes. Did I really? Or did I just say that's close enough? You'd be surprised how many people will fold a circle in half, and it's not in half, and the line is way off center, and to them it's in half, because it's close. Right. It's a concept. They didn't see what they did. They saw what they thought they were doing. Yes. And then when you show them, this is in alignment, this is not, you go, oh. Then they got it. See, but when we work from our head, we don't get it. Yes. Okay, so, so now we have, once, once you get those in alignment, then crease them really well with your straight edge. Okay. And when you open it up, question is, what do we have that we didn't have before? More points. More points. Be more specific. Uh, well, we have 12 points. 12? Um, where do you see 12? Well, we have six. And seven, sorry, and seven in the middle. Good. See, so... If we stay with it, we finally will get out of our head and into what's on the circle, yes. which is seven points, six on the circumference, one in the center. Now we have a center to the circle. We didn't have a center to the circle before, did we? No. So what is this thing about defining a circle by its center? We all believe it. We all act on it. Every corporation has a 
as a CEO, he's the center. He's the guy that calls the shots, right? Yes. That's flat earth thinking, isn't it? That's 2D thinking. I'm the center and the sun and everything else goes around me. So it's embedded in the systems that we have developed and we don't even recognize it. The center of my life is me. Well, the center of my life is me, but my life is not life. So the center is not me. The center of life is life itself. And I happen to be a localized, individualized center that has consciousness of myself and of everything else. So for me, folding circles has become a, a philosophy because it's giving me information. But the information comes from doing. Let's go back to that first fold. You folded it 180 degrees. Yes. That's because we fold things on a flat surface. If you fold it in your hand, it goes 360 degrees, doesn't it? Yes. So that's a spherical pattern of movement, isn't it? So that shows us the origin of the circle. Where did it come from? Came from the compression of a sphere. Never lost that. It's still whole, still unity, and it shows you the pattern of movement is spherical. But it also gives you those four points, which is tetrahedral. So it's it's showing you where, where it came from, which is the sphere. It's showing you where it's going, which is the, the straight line polyhedral definition of how we perceive the world we live in. And it's from this kind of 2D geometry that we've discovered so many things, so many ratios, so many plans and, and architecture that we then take these 2D images and we overlay them on images of real life. Say, so see, that shell is a Fibonacci series. No. That's, that's not what the shell is, but it's our interpretation of a seashell or a plant growth because we have discovered a certain ratio of parts to whole. And then we look at it and say part to part. This leaf to this leaf to this leaf has a certain sequence around the stem. And that relates to what I understand about spirals and Fibonacci. See, so it all, it's all taking place in the mind. And it prevents us from doing any longer. Hmm. We just have these overlays, these maps, 2D maps. We overlay it on three-dimensional world and say, that's what it is. So if I take my map, I can then project that out into a three-dimensional object and the map of that tetrahedron, that first fold, I can project that out into a tetrahedron solid, one of the five platonic solids. Um, and because we have these five platonic solids, they become, quote, fundamental to mathematics and geometry, but they're not. They're just where we got stuck. It's not that they're wrong, it's just that we're stuck there. And we have to go beyond that. The classifications that we put together 3,500, 2,500 years ago, it's not that they're not relevant. They're no longer relevant. Mm -hmm. No more than that now. We, it's stupid to call them solids when we live in a universe that we know is not solid. It's about relationship. So anyway, back to these <laughs> seven points. That gives us the information to know what to do next. What, how do we get at that information? How do we understand what those seven points mean?
How do we understand that there's a seventh point in the center? And it wasn't there before. We, yeah, it's revealed itself. It revealed itself. Did it reveal itself or is it just the revelation of a relationship? It's not about the thing. It's about the relationship. Mm. The only, let's go back, the only value, which is a lot bigger than meaning, value is something that's irreplaceable in our lives, right? It has value. Meanings, we change meanings all the time. We, it's based on beliefs. Mm. And those, those meanings can lead us to value. So, how do we get at the meaning of this center? Is that it's a relationship of these three lines where they intersect. So we first we first folded it in half. Okay. Yeah. Then we folded it in thirds. Seven points. We have three diameters, right? We didn't have three before, we just had one. It took me about to consciously realize <laughs> what I'm going to describe. It took me about 27 years of falling circles before it hit me. When we fold it in half and we fold it into thirds. That second fold, let's just stop there for a minute. That second fold, we need to look at and to know what we did to do that. And I'm going to just draw out what that second fold is so you can see it. Fold it in half. Then we do the second fold. Open it up and look at it. That's what we folded. Mm -hmm. We didn't fold a full diameter. Because the circumference was aligned to itself, it showed us the center. Just two folds. Uh huh. That tells us that the center is the circumference. The center and the circumference are the circle. They're the same thing. Now, a rational mind is not going to accept that very comfortably. We're going to struggle with that one. But no, the circle has a center. No, the circle is the center. If you think about it concentrically, shift your mind into concentric circles. With that compass, we can spread that and make larger and larger circles around the center. Well, that tells us right away there's a center to start with. But we started with a circle without a center. So that axiom doesn't hold true. We have to question that. And we folded it once and there was no center. There, there was not a visible, a visible center. Because we folded the circumference to itself. So there's, it is the center. But we don't see it. When we folded it once more in thirds, now we see there's a center. Forget about these lines, they're not there yet. So we have, this is kind of like the peace, the old peace symbol, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Circle with the you know, I don't even know what that means. But um, we've got two diameters. Now we know they're not the same because this one goes this way and this one turns that way. They, they fold in two different directions because they were folded the same way. 
to when you open it up. We're now in reverse of how they fold. Right? So the second fold is what gives us the center. That tells us the diameter is more fundamental than the center of the circle. And yet we gauge all of our measuring on the radius, which is mm -hmm. the second thing that happens. And it doesn't happen just once, it happens twice. And it happens 120 degrees from each other. Mm. So right away, we've got a division without the full folding. So when you fold it over, now we've got complete division. And you can see that we have four diameters, I mean, four radii and one diameter. So it took me all those years to say, I don't have three diameters. I thought I did, because that's what my eyes told me. But depending on the accuracy of your folding, these four radii may or may not come together. Mm -hmm. They may or may not touch at the same point. Four radii. We started with four points, didn't we? So there's a consistency reflecting itself fold by fold by fold because it's principle. We haven't gotten off into a tangent, which is would be inconsistent. So that's that's one of the, the things that I find most interesting is that after all those years of falling circles, I still get caught up in my own mind in what I think I'm doing rather than observing and what it is that's really happening. Mm. That's where the information is. So we've got we now have these seven points. These how many lines have we got? We've got four, five, five lines. How does how does five figure into this? Well, let's go back to the compression of the sphere to a circle disc. Here we've got our circle disc. Mm -hmm. We have a top. We have a bottom circle. They're congruent, they're the same size. We have a planar edge that's a circle, circle ring. That's congruent. And we have two edges that hold those three circles together, those three circle planes. Think of a coin. You know, you've got three planes, one circular ring, top, bottom, and two edges. That's five parts. So five is there in the very description of the properties of the circle, which is the transformation of spherical unity. Five is important because it's there at the very beginning. Fibonacci fears and the five, and why is that important as the Pentagon and the 510 symmetry? Is that we put so much emphasis on that as a place to start trying to sift through the proportional relationships we see in nature that we forgot the context and we're dealing with the parts. Mm -hmm. Well, the context is the whole, and that's when we started, and that has five parts. Now, there were seven principles that I listed, right? There are seven points that we have. There are five properties to this circle, unless you want to include the inside volume of the sphere, six, and the outside undefined space that it's in is seven. Mm -hmm. See, so there's another way of seeing a consistency of seven 
by being more inclusive. In other words, we're not talking about a thing, an article, an object, separate from an environment, separate from what it is. We're seeing it in context, and then all of a sudden the numbers begin to show us something that we didn't see before because we only use numbers this way in a sequence. And then we have laws and rules about how to use those numbers and how not to use them. So what I'm, see not being a mathematician or a geometer, I have the advantage of playing with numbers in a way that a math person doesn't. And I can play with the geometry in a way that, you know, our, our traditional geometry will not allow you to do. And interestingly enough, since we're in this technological medium, we're not real life next to each other folding. Uh, we have this, it's not even space between us because the only space between me and your image is the distance to me and my screen. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's it, it's that relationship that's missing. And so what do we do with technology? We can take the geometry and, and we can distort it in any way we want and make these things look real. We can make a plant growth on the image on the screen mm. look like it's really growing and moving and doing something but it's nothing ex it's it's just a highly technologicalized motion picture yes that's all it is it's... so you can see from the cave wall of drawing pictures to represent what's outside and I want control over what's outside, so I'm going to draw a picture of this bison so I can go outside and kill it and live another day and feed my family. It's power over. The image is power over. So very early on, we discovered if we drew these images, we, had, we could imagine, we could project a power over. And so then pretty soon when we got into, you know, geometry, it became a power over whatever it is we're drawing a picture of. Power over the circle, power over the square, power over, here's a, here's a picture of my, all my sheep. And I got 40 of them. And... I want you to keep track of my sheep for me. So you draw a picture that represents all the sheep so that you know you got them all. Mm. You know, I mean, it's, it's, there's power in that kind of control and assessment. And so pretty soon we develop a camera and we take pictures and that gives us even more power but it removes us further from the direct experience because now we're looking at a picture that looks real. Pretty soon we decide to put those in sequence so that it looks like it's moving. And this is, this is my era of growing up, the motion picture. I grew into an era of incredible sophistication in making pictures move and making me believe that they're real because I can't tell the difference anymore. When I see somebody putting a simulation of a human being up there, <laughs> now, Terrence, I don't know whether you're real or not. You could be a virtual simulation that I'm Absolutely. talking to, and we could be having a discussion. I would never know the difference. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and particularly since I've met, I haven't met you in person, I don't have any information to gauge whether what is coming at me is real or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this, this gives a little twist to our relationship <laughs> that otherwise wouldn't be there if we'd met on the street. Yes. 
That's why I fold circles, because it's a direct experience that I can observe, and there's nothing in between except my ideas and all the other people and the history that have told me what geometry, what mathematics, what nature, what crystal growth, what all these things are, that gets in, that gets in the way of my perception. You know, when just getting up in the morning, all these ideas about what it is to get up in the morning change how I get up in the morning. Mm -hmm. The morning hasn't changed, but my relationship to how I'm going to move through the day has changed because of what's in my head. It's going to be a good day. It's going to be a bad day. I've got this to do because I didn't finish it yesterday. Or I've got this to do to get ready for tomorrow. And what about today? And what is, what is the experience of getting up and doing today, right now? And, you know, we talk about that in terms of being present. And being present to me simply means being fully present with what you are doing at the moment. Not what you need to do, not what you have to do, not what you used to do, but being present. And that's not a difficult thing, except the habit of thinking is so strong that it's hard to get beyond it. It's hard to be present. Because if we're thinking about it, we're not presently with it. And <laughs> anyway, this this was supposed to be about folding circles, not all this other stuff in my mind. But that's where I am this morning, so that's what you're getting. Uh, <laughs> in in looking at these seven points, now we're not going to look at the lines first, because the first thing we did was touch points. Yes. It's all about touching points. So we have to be consistent with that. Because if you touch the points, the lines will be where they need to be. All the way through. If the points you are touching are in alignment, the lines that are generated will be where they need to be. You don't have to worry about that. So our question now is, how many choices do we have in touching these seven points? A lot. Lots. That's not good enough. That doesn't tell me. It. See, that's the generalization that we work off. Yeah, we do have lots of points, lots of choices. But the question is, do we have lots of choices? How do we know that? We do it by touching points. Mm. Let's find out. If we touch this point to this point, that's, that does one thing, doesn't it? it? It divides this in half, it divides that in half. If we touch that to that, or we can touch that this point to this point, which means we've divided it in half, which is already there. Or if we touch this point to this point, opposite points together, yes. then we divide this in half, which is what we did when we put those two points together. We can put every, because we're working on a ratio of one to two, we can put one point to the center, we can do every other point to the center because that would be consistent with one to two, one to the center, skip two, three to the center, skip three, put four to the center, skip five, we're back to where we started. Mm -hmm. Or we can put every point to the center, right? Sure. 
That basically gives us three ways to fold seven points. There are no other options. We don't have lots of options. It shows us that we only have three ways we can do it. Point to opposite point, which divides us in half. Point and every other point to the center, or every point to the center. Those are the only three options. Now we can work backwards and say, we have seven points, there are three ways to fold them to the center, or three ways to fold them next. There are three diameters. And in terms of the properties, there are top circle, bottom circle plane, and circular ring plane. So we have three. Three is structural, three is the, is the tetrahedron fold. So all of a sudden we're seeing a, a continuity that is totally consistent with itself. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with the generalizations we make about how many more we have a lot or how as long as our close. Because, because we keep the center as our reference point though. The circle becomes a reference point, yes. The, the center, the center is our reference point. It's a reference point to what? To, to our because folding, to our folding. To the circle. Yes. The center is a reference point to the circle, just like with a compass, that's a reference point. But that's all it is. It's not the center of the circle. Think about concentricity. The circle gets larger and larger. What I didn't talk about before was gets smaller and smaller and smaller. If you can make the compass big, you can make it small, but because it's limited as a tool, it won't go beyond, it won't go into itself. Mm. It's never zero, it's always more than zero. Mm. See, and that's the problem with mathematics is we can, we can take this and make it down to zero. That's a concept. Because this is zero to begin with. It's <laughs> empty. It's nothing. And it's everything because it holds all potential through movement. So um, the, the, the three, we started with the three, the most possible combinations of three is seven. Can't be anymore. You can work it out mathematically. You can work it out proportionally. You can work it out any way you want. Combination of three can be no more than seven. So here we have three diameters, seven points. Can't get more fundamental than that, whether you're working proportionally or with the numbers. So the question is then, we have three options. Which one do we go with? What do you think? Your, your call. My call. Uh, you, you are the master of folding. There is no master of folding. I fold, you don't fold. That's the only difference between us. Um, <laughs> So, since you are folding, this is your call. Which do you want to do? Okay, uh, let's fold it the each point in half. Okay, so that means we're going to fold. No, no the on, on, on the side, on the side, like you did. Hold on. Like this. Well, no, no, that's, that's, that's the first one you did. The first one you did. Okay, so. Show, show me show me what yeah. you're doing here. Yeah, you did you did like this, uh, the two points. Oh, okay. So let's let's do that. Put those two points yeah. together. Yeah. And increase it. Increase it all the way down. All the way, all the way down. Yeah. I mean. When you put a crease in a circle, 
it goes all the way across. There are no line segments. Yes. Every line is a chord. Now, see what we've got? We can do that all the way around, making sure that those points are exactly together. This can get all the way through. Reset all the way through. Okay. Okay, so now, how many diameters do we have that are going through the center? Uh, six. Six? That's right. Yeah. How many points does that give us? Uh, 13. Twelve on the outside, one on the center. Yeah. Okay. This is interesting because you have done something that nobody has done in all the years I've been working with kids. To get this, these six lines, we just fold two endpoints to themselves. Nobody has ever decided they want to do it this way, but it's doing the same thing. Yes. See, so that's just another approach to folding opposite points together. Uh-huh. You see that? Yes, of course. So, this is the beauty of it. You saw something you wanted to do and didn't realize that it was doing something else. <laughs> that you were doing something else. And how oftentimes we do something without making that connection. You know, and then later we may say, oh, I already did that. I just wasn't aware of it. <laughs> um, okay, so what do we do the next? We're going to take. Now, this, this throws us back into the other two that we didn't take, uh -huh. which means to the center. Okay. Do we take them all to the let's let's do all of them to the center. Okay, Just all, all the points. All twelve. All twelve. No, all 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 six. All, all six. Okay. You you don't understand yet, but we will later that these first three are fundamental. The second three we fold the are are not. Secondary. But we don't see that right now because they all look the same. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna right now. No, right now let's fold every other one to the center. Okay. Fold one to the center, skip it, skip the next one, fold that to the center. So you're gonna okay here, take a look. You folded this to the center. Yeah. Okay. Unfold that. Unfold it. Yeah. Fold that. Okay. Now, look. Look where I am. This is your next crease, but you're 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 gonna skip this. Okay. Yeah. You're gonna go to the. See. You're, you're doing one to the center. Skip this one. Go to the next one. Put that to the center. Yes. All right, this is getting, hold on a minute. Open it up. It's at a 60 degree angle, right? Yeah, that's yeah. what you're looking for. Yeah. If you're looking for angles, the angle is just a description of what yeah. you're doing. Well, we're going to create like a triangle on the inside, kind of. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Now, there's a triangle. Yep. Now, that tells me that you have not folded those no. points exactly. I have lost. I have lost precision. Yes. Yeah. So you've 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 put. You didn't put the point to the center. You just put someplace close to the point to the center. Okay, let me just try again. Hold on. Yeah, you're right. It's the, yeah. So what you've done is 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 not wrong. It's just not accurate. Yep. Hold on. But it's not wrong because it showed you <laughs> that you weren't accurate. And that's the feedback. That's that's what the circle has to offer. Is is allow is, is allow me to see whether I'm being accurate or not, whether I'm being general or whether I'm being specific. Yes. Okay. Uh, hold on. So, so this, this, is what, this is what you get. Like this. Good. Yeah. You can you can see now. Let's just look at that. And there are. What is there that wasn't there before? We got a, we can say a triangle, yeah. So how many points does that give us now? Three. Three. No, Four. that just describes a triangle. How many points are here? Four. Four? Well, we still have the center of the triangle. Okay, but let's count them all. We have one, ah. two, three center points, right? And we have the outside points. Okay. We have the center point. Seven. So we have seven, seven. points. Mm. Um, forgetting about these points at a moment, because those are secondary. The seven points. When we had a circle, it had seven points. Right? Now we have a triangle and it has seven points. So here numbers allow us to see the pattern is the same. It hasn't changed, but the form has changed. It's changed from a circle to a triangle, but the pattern is the same because they both have seven points. See, so there's a whole level of information that numbers can provide for us that we don't take advantage of because we don't count it in that way. We just look at the form and say, oh, it's a triangle, three points. Well, yeah, but it has three perpendicular bisectors, which give us three more points, which give us the center, which is seven. Those perpendicular bisectors are still diameters. They didn't go away. It just got folded under. And I know they're there. And I can unfold them if I want. If I need, if I need the diameter, I can do that. If I need that shape. Okay. We do have these other six points. But this gives you an idea of now the difference between the bisecting point and the radius or the full diameter. So we can see that there's, there's a difference between this point and this point. They're different lengths. 
Mm-hmm. When we look at um, we can fool any fool goes in both directions, so don't forget the duality part of it. So we have that, and we have that very different. Now we can see that this is a different length. And this, and this, right? So, so we see this, we see this, we see this. Three different lengths of the line, just by in in that triangle. Now, this, what is this? To this, to this. Isn't that in thirds? Yes. Yeah. So we divided the triangle in half. But we've also got it divided into thirds. Now, to comp- this is not, see, at any point in the folding so far, even with the first fold, we could have gotten into forming and reforming it into different reconfigurations. Yes. Um, So every fold gives us more information to work with, but there is a consistency in the developing of frequency, just like in sound. You know, there are, you you modulate your frequency up and down wherever you want it. And you can do the same thing with the folds and the line. They're, They're giving you different frequencies, different circuits to work with. To complete this circuit, we then will take, we, we folded these points to the center. Now we're going to fold the unfolded points to the center. The other ones. Yeah. So we're going to do another triangle using the, see, if, if you take if you take this point, that's folded to the center. Yeah. So go to the next point. Fold that to the center. Okay. Do every other one all okay. the way around. So what you're doing is you're completing a consistency of folding outside circle to inside circle. Outside to inside center. See, and that, that's the beauty of it, as, as you, you're not sure whether to fold one or not, and you fold it, and you find out you already folded it. Um, <laughs> Indeed. That's because you're not familiar with the process. I can guarantee if we folded four circles uh, into this four-frequency grid, you would not have that problem. Because you would you would know what you're doing, you would see it, and your body would understand. The movement itself would um, is implanted in your brain in a sense. Okay. Okay. So now, when you look at that, what do you see? That's that's good. How many triangles are there? How many? Yeah. Sorry, how many did you say? How many? How many? How many? Okay, let's do it this way. How many large triangles do you have? The inscribed triangles. Two large triangles. Okay. That gives us a hexagon, a hexagon star. Yes. Now, if you'll notice that your creases don't come together at yes. that end point. Yes. That's not going to happen next time, I guarantee you, because you see it now. Um, so this, and, and each, it's, there's an in and out pattern now. Star point in, star point in, star point out, star point in, star point out, in, out, in, all the way around the center. That, that gives you a, an understanding now of 
this four what I call four frequency diameter grid. The grid is divided into four equal parts. And I'm gonna we're gonna, we're gonna do a, a quick review. We fold it in, in half. Okay. Okay. That's just what that is. And we fold it in, into thirds. And that's what we got. Wow. Just fold, see, fold, you know, coloring in every other yeah. area. Why every other one? Because we started with a ratio of one to two. Yeah. So that shows us this in a different way. We can skip that. This is what we just folded. So we we went from this to this. That's a big jump in frequency. We could go to the next frequency. This is a four frequency. Then we go to eight frequency. Oh, wow. You can do a lot more with eight frequency. A higher frequency, you've got more modulate. Or we can do this the same folding. 16 frequency or 32 frequency. So you can begin to see that, you know, the modulation of frequency is a geometric progression. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. It's at, at 32, I haven't taken it beyond that because then it gets really picky and to do that, I would get a larger circle. Then I could go into the 32 and it would look like a whole bunch of these with that kind of space between. Then I could be work, work with it. The A frequency is like an octave in music. That's all you need to know to do everything this circle will do. But a higher frequency gives you more complexity, more variation, more things to play with. But it, it, it doesn't, it's based on your octave. And just like in music, it's not the notes. It's not the points of intersection. It's what you do between the notes that creates the music. So, oh, triangle, which we just did, but here we're doing it in an eight frequency rather than the four frequency. All of a sudden now we can do some, the truncating is not a cutting off. We just truncated the, the triangle to a, a, a pentagon or to a hexagon. Yeah. No, because it's still a triangle. We can fold that into a tetrahedron. First thing we fold it in the in that first fold. This is going to use so much, it's really floppy. So in, in, in folding the tetrahedron, this is the first fold in the circle in half. But here it's formed, not just as a platonic solid, it has more information than that. So we can take that and quote, truncate it, which means we just fold in This is really unwieldy. This is not the thing I should be demonstrating. We can fold it in. And you can see how we now have partially truncated that. We can fold that in. And we can fold all four corners in, and we can get a truncated tetrahedron. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of measuring and cutting and constructing to do traditionally. Yeah, we just folded the circle. And we can do that because you're not cutting off, you're folding in. You're not adding two, is what we do in stellating, you're folding out. So truncation, which is a cutting off of, and stellating, which is an adding to, 
is simply a folding in or folding out. So all of a sudden, all this complexity that we've developed in terms of geometry and constructing geometry, and now it's even more complex because we use the technology to do that for us, it's still doing the same thing, cutting and pacing. Hmm. See, so don't be fooled by the, and wowed by the technology. We're still working with parts and pieces, putting them together or taking them apart. This grid, you'll notice it did not change. Higher frequency did not change. It is absolute. It doesn't change. What changes is what you do with the circle, how you reform it. You know, do, we, do we want to uh, put it into the... We want to put it into the six or yeah. five, which is our pentagon. Or do we want to put it into the four? So now that's what you were going to do in the beginning. It's a quarter. That's what we're used to. Fold in half, fold in quarters. Why quarters? Because it's four. Because it's 90 degrees. Because we work off of 90 degree as an angle. And yet in that first fold, you saw that the crease was at 90 degrees halfway between the two points. That tells us that 90 degrees is about movement. The, we need to go back to the beginning again for a minute, but 90 degrees is about movement. It's, it's, it's not about the form. We have made it static because we draw it out two-dimensionally, and we use that as a measure for all other angles. And then it's easy to divide 360 into four parts, 90 degrees. That's it. But it's not it because it's about movement. It's not about this static angle that we use so much. And let's go back and fold another circle in half. Another circle? Another circle. Now, if you see those two points in your imagination and you put them exactly together, then, then the rest of it will be lined up. See, and that's 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 the beauty of the circle, is it does the work for you. All you have to know is what you're doing. Okay. Um, fold it into thirds again. Um, fold it in half, and then okay. into thirds, just like we did before. So you're folding, making sure that the circumference is lined up to itself. You've got about one to one or one over two. You know, the interesting thing about folding it into thirds is that if, if I am clear and in my thinking and with what I'm doing, I don't have to, to look and fumble and slide back and forth. I can pretty much know exactly where that third mark is and then get it accurately. And that's simply because I folded a lot of circles and it's no different than a carpenter 
or a cabinet maker who can tell you within a 30 seconds of an inch where he is because his eyes have, have, he's trained his eyes to see proportionally and not to use a measure. Absolutely. And so it's the same thing with folding. You will train your eyes to know exactly where that third mark is without having to measure or slide back and forth. <clears throat> so when we open it up, we have these six points, three diameters, or one diameter and four radii. We have to just define how many different ways there are to reform this circle. How, how, how many different ways can you reform it using only those creases? Make a tetrahedron. Open-ended tetrahedron. Open that up into a square. So you have an open-ended square-based pyramid. Fold in and out in a star-like configuration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You bring the two ends together, you get, you know, what's called a bow tie. You get two tetrahedrons, which is very different than two tetrahedrons this way, where one is inside the other. Um, from that, that bow tie shape, you then can close it so that you now have two tetrahedrons joined by their surface, a common surface. When we look at it in this way, this bow tie shape where we have two that are joined on an edge, folding circles is, is about seeing what you don't see. So we don't see that there are four tetrahedrons here. No. Because we don't think that way. But if a tetrahedron is four points in space, we have one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Then we have absolutely one, one. We have four tetrahedrons. Yes. Two are made with three sides and an open plane. The other two are made with two sides and two open planes. See that? Yes. See, so that's more complete information than just saying I have two tetrahedra so I'm by an edge length. Because the further into you get, what you don't see is going to be so important. It's just like I see the notes, but when I move between them is when I make music. And so here... Do you have some bobby pins? Yes, I have them ready. Okay, put a bobby pin in here to hold it so it, it doesn't move. Whoops. Yep. I can hear you again. Uh, incidentally, um, talking about the seven and the importance of three and seven. It's here. One, two, three, four, yes. five, Here. six. Yes. So, still moves. What moves? What moves? That, that 90 degree angle is what moves, isn't it? 
Triangles don't move. <laughs> they're, they're structural. They are not going to move. So right away, there's a beautiful example of where we have missed it. We're working off of misconception, misinformation, meaning information is missing. Mm -hmm. The concept is not complete. It's missing something. And what we're missing is the movement of that 90 degrees. And we take that to be stable. Everything is on 90 degrees, on the X, Y, Z axis. When you think about it, the whole 2D development has been on that 90 degrees circle, square, squaring the circle. Nobody could figure out how to square the circle because mm -hmm. they're different. But we have in a way that we don't recognize. We are used, we used to use circles. Remember the old newsprint? Yes. And the circle matrix that gave us the images? What do we use now to give us an image? A square, a pixel. Yes. So in a sense, we have squared the circle because we're now drawing circles, not as Euclid said, with points, circles, but with squares, pixels. But still keeping that separation. So here we have one circle. Let's make another one just like it. Uh, I have, I have, yeah. So fold it, three diameters. The, the same, do the same, do the same. The same. Yeah. When we think about pattern, we usually think of repetition. So we're going to use this as a pattern and make another one just like, well, that's not altogether an accurate understanding of pattern because this is an object. It's a part. It's, it's a reformation of the, of the pattern of unity because it's still unity. It's still mm -hmm. whole. Yes. It's just a part of it. So that changes our whole idea of parts and wholes. They're not separate. And if all we're working, you know, our education is based on parts to whole. If I give you enough parts, you're going to put them together and make a whole. As a designer, if I give you enough criteria to work with, enough information, you're going to put together into a whole package. That package is part of a much larger package, which is your client is holding that package. And he's being held by the package of the market that he's addressing. And the market is being held by, you know, a cultural package that says this is important. Yeah. It goes on and on and on. So how do we define whole and parts? There is only whole. There is only unity. It exists, period. So how then do we consider the part which is still whole? We can't just call the part whole. And yet, <laughs> see, this is where words get us into trouble because then that throws us back into our mind and this whole polemic things, dialectic of words that we fight with each other about. So you got another one of these? Yes. Okay. Put them together. You've got, first you've got to know what you got. So you got two tetrahedrons that are joined by a common edge. Mm -hmm. So put these two together joined on common edges. Just using the edges. Right. Put them together. So they're, they're going to reflect the same, same thing. Okay. 
Okay. What do you got? See, the, the, the thing that we're missing, aside from you and I being in the same space, is that you don't have other people around you to look at to see what they're doing. And this is the beauty of the dynamics of a class or a group absolutely, of people. Absolutely, absolutely. Is that if I'm not sure what to do, I'm going to look around and see what other people are doing. And wow, that looks like it works. And I'm going to try that. And I works. Okay. Or somebody might say, hey, you're not doing it right. <laughs> I mean, there's this beautiful interaction of feedback. Absolutely. In a group. Absolutely. That's so crucial. So anyway, this is what I came up with. What did you come up with? Um, I mean, okay. I mean, it's, It's not the same. So, so you did put edges together. Yeah. That's not wrong. It's just another direction. Okay. And maybe that means you didn't understand my instructions because my instructions weren't clear. Or maybe they were clear and you just understood them differently because you're a different person. You know, there's no wrong or right in this. This is why the group comes together and say, you know, This looks good to me. And somebody looks at it and says, looks good to me, looks good to me. Well, so as a group, we've decided that this is the way we're going to go instead of maybe this way. Yeah. And if we all decide this way, then we're going to take that as far as we can until it dead ends. Then we're going to go back and look at this. But the beauty is here. See that square in the center? quadrilateral still moves nothing static about the square it moves it doesn't move It's okay right. you've put you've put yeah you've put the hair the hairpins opposite each other instead of joining yeah yeah so so that what what you're seeing is that this is the same as this you, same but, as but you've used but you've used two more hairpins yeah so it's it's giving you a a circular consistency that this does not give you. Yeah. My experience is the most difficult aspect of my mind is to be consistent with what I do. Mm -hmm. The human mind is not made to be consistent. It's made to to find something that works and develop a habit. And that's going to get in the way eventually because it's going to, it's going to be out of place. Okay, so here we've got two units of two each. One circle is two, two circles is four. So we can assume that Another one of these four circles, or another one of these two circles, four units, yeah. will give us four circles of eight units and thinking about it. But we don't want to think about this. We just want to do it. <laughs> so you don't have another one. No. You have two more plates? Yeah. That's going to take us. See, we're limited in time, aren't we? Well. Yeah. I mean, we don't have all day to do this. <laughs> so I'm going to show you what you would have done otherwise. Um, you would have taken these two and noticed that the circumference is on one side and the creases are on the other side. Right? Straight lines, curved lines. So you can take two of those and put those together on the straight lines, same way we did before, and you're going to get a sphere. And so this is. So you've got your square. Right, the, the other half, the other half of this. Yeah. 
Yeah. Say now, if we were together, I could put yours with mine and we could get this. Yeah, of course. <laughs> See, that's the beauty. In a group, usually everybody folds this by themselves. Oops, my, my mic just fell. Everybody put, folds this by themselves. Yeah. Then two of you get together and we put these two together to get this. And four of us have two of these. So four of us have to figure out how to put those together to get this. So it's not a process of me sitting in a room by myself folding. It's, it's, a, it's a dynamic process of an interchange where yeah. we all do our own thing the same way. Then we get together and figure out how those two things go together. And then those things will only go together this way. But we've had the experience of working individually, working in groups of two, working in groups of four, and finding that all groups of four have come up with the same thing. Then we can begin to expand the groups of four to the entire classroom and say, take four of these, because we know four points in space is a tetrahedron, and four of these together to form a tetrahedron. And how do you do that? And there are many, many ways that kids come up with, but only one way works. And they'll figure that out. And then you see a beautiful consistency of frequency development in a spherical form that you would not get from the flat form at all. Yeah. Circle does things that the drawer of circles couldn't imagine. And that's where we are. We're stuck at a place where we've got a system that takes us only so far and we cannot imagine what it will do in another form because we don't know what that other form is. I'm telling you, that other form is a circle. It's not a drawing. And it's, it's where we need to go. If we're going to go any further, we have to understand we have to start from unity. This is the sphere that got compressed into a circle. It got folded. Now we can see the sphere. We can see that it can go outward infinitely. It goes inward infinitely. Because what have we done? We've taken four circles, put four centers together. How can there be four centers if it circles defined by one center? And, and yeah. The logic that we have developed to define and explain our lives is not logical. It's only a logic that we've created, that we work off of, and that we never question. <clears throat> so when I say the circle is the center, you're saying that's not logical because that's not the system of how we think. <clears throat> it's not how things are because how I think is how things are. So here we see we can have a circle. It doesn't have a center, and we can do things with it that you couldn't do with a circle with a center because you made a division and a separation. So <clears throat> the hardest part of all of this is shifting the thinking to thinking what we don't think we know, <laughs> if that makes any sense. It's seeing what we don't see. It's observing what is what we do and what is being done without judgment, without preconception, without some idea of where we're going, just looking and seeing what happens. And, and I think that's the solution to this incredibly complex social problem on this planet today is as simple in my mind as consider the whole first, then look at the parts. 
Don't try and make a hole from putting the parts together. It'll never happen. They'll always fall apart. There's never been a time in history that we haven't, quote, unified and made some kind of a hole that hasn't fallen apart. Mm. Why? Because we didn't start from the hole. We started from parts. And from any part will take you, if you, if you really look at that, I've always thought any book on that bookshelf behind you, you can take that, whatever it is, just arbitrarily take it out. And you can have a whole 12 year course on that one book and cover all the subjects that you would cover that we've separated out by going deeply into it. And all of the mathematics, all of the geometry that we have developed is in that one circle. And if you go into it deeply enough, you'll find it. All the connections are there. But that's not logically how we think about things. And yet, you folded, and just a little bit, you folded enough to know that there's something happening there that you're not in control of. Um, now, we folded the tetrahedron. <laughs> We have time to go into another another direction. Okay. Do you have another paper plate? Uh, yes, and another, another yes, I have, I have many plates. <laughs> okay. Fold three diameters. Uh, three diameters. Just like we did before. Fold it in okay. half, then into thirds. Shall I take apart an existing one or oh, you could do that, yeah. 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 Okay, so oh, you've got your three diameters full? Yeah. Hold it. Here we've got our circle. Make, yeah. And, and we've got our three diameters. Okay, I, I, I'll make that one second. Yeah, I'll go and make Seven that. points. Because it's, it's quite hard to do accurately this one. More accurate than before. <laughs> okay, and it'll be more accurate than next time. <laughs> okay, so you've got the three points and you've got the halfway marks. So yeah. Here's where we don't need to measure anything, it already gives us that information. That's the halfway part. So you're going to take one point, you're going to fold it to that halfway to the center on the opposite side. So you're going all the way apart, all close, the way, okay, touching those points and creasing that. Yeah. Open that up. Go to the next point and do the same thing all the way across. Crease it. And then go to the third point. Take that all the way across to the opposite center point. Crease it. See, this is where when we call center point, it gets confusing because if I say to the center point of the opposite side, the student will hear center point and they'll fold that to the center. No, center point of opposite side. Okay, and if you're consistent in doing that. Okay. You, you follow the tetrahedron.
So you're just taking the yeah. three points of those triangles and putting those points together. Now we find that three is one. Three points is one point. Oh, we can take one point and have three. Where does that fit in our mathematics? I mean, you've got to do a lot of calculations to get that to happen. <laughs> um, this cannot happen with your four frequency grid. Mm -hmm. When you fold your triangle, Well, this is folded in because it was eight, but you don't have these creases. You have a different set of creases. Yeah. That, that gives you, you know, a triangle within a triangle. And the beauty of this is that you can fold this inside out. Remember? Folding always goes in both directions. Yeah. You want to explore all of that. You don't want to just forget that you can put the inside out. So if you if you reform that tetrahedron, it's the same. It's the same, exactly the same tetrahedron, but now the inside is out, and it gives you a wonderful 90 degree angle here. It gives you 30 degree angle here gives you 60 degree angle here. So you've got a lot more information to work with. When you open that up to your 60 degree angles, you now have a smaller tetrahedron. So if you do that to all four, I mean all three, then you've got, and you can show that this, this fits right in there. It fits right in there. So if, I had, if I had another one. It, it is. What's that? If I had another one. It has another one. Yes, you, you, you created another one. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the same tetrahedron, but you've got three more. So you've got four. These three are formed by three surfaces and one open plane. You can have all three out, or you can just put two out, or you can put one out. Those are all options that will take you in very different directions as you begin to create multiples of the same thing. Figure out those. My process is if I do this and I mess around with it and I say, this intrigues me more than the others. I like this. I want to do something with that. I'll make another one just like it. And then I'll explore all the options of how they can go together on the planes, on the angles, on the points, what works, what doesn't work. And then from that, I'll figure out, okay, maybe I'll figure out, I like that best. So I'll make another one just like that. And I'll figure out how those go together, either in twos or in threes. Or maybe even in fours, because you're in four symmetry or five symmetry. It will tell me which one is going to work. And out of those, which one of those interests me most to make another one just like it. And then keep that process going of developing more complex systems from a very simple folding. Um, This is traditionally our solid tetrahedron. Yeah. It doesn't have these three. You can see where the, the center point is, and it's got those divisions there. Yeah. But you have lines here. You don't, it's not consistently divided all the way around. That's another direction. We're not going to go there at this point. Um, when you open it up from one point to three points, how has it changed? There's been a change. 
the tetrahedron is now open. Is it still a tetrahedron? No. And what is it? Well, it's a kind of a triangle in, in, in motion. Kind of a triangle. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a triangle thing. Um, how many triangles does this thing have? Uh, four, f- five. Five? Five. Yeah. Five. Where, where do you see five? Well, it's one, two, three, four in the whole th- in the whole, whole thing. There are all those. Yeah, it's one in the middle, three, and, and, and the big one. Oh, okay. Yes, you're counting flat. Yeah. This isn't flat. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, four. Oh, sorry. No, no, seven. You're right. No, <laughs> you're close. <laughs> if, you're tr- if you're looking at these triangle planes, and, and I'm going to be more explicit, how many triangle planes does it have? Uh, four. Uh, sorry, no, 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 sorry. Uh, se- no, wait, hold on. <laughs> ah, it's eight. Good. It has eight. Sorry, yeah. Four of them we see. Yeah. And four of them we don't see. Yeah. If you count as planes, yes. Yeah. Well, that's why I said. I said planes. Now, four of those are solid planes. Four of those are open planes. Yes. Geometry does talk about solid and open planes, but they don't talk about the open planes as things we don't see. They just make a projection and assume that's what it is. How do we know that is a triangle? Well, we can take a triangle and put it right on there. Well, that is a triangle. It's a triangle plane, but it's open. Three, three points. I close it like this. There's still three points. It's an open triangle plane. It's still an open triangle plane. Three points make a triangle. Whether it's a closed plane or an open plane is irrelevant. It's that relationship with those three points. Are they close together? Are they far apart? Are they on a flat plane? Which means they're collinear. There is no relationship. They're just points on a line. The importance of this, do you have two of these? Uh, I, yeah, yeah, I, I can, yeah, I can make two of these, yeah. Kind okay. of, yeah. If you can make another one of these. And, and while you're, while you're doing that, for anybody else that's watching, I'm going to show them this, which is, different than the four frequency is very different. And this is the four frequency that we did before. Yeah. And this is the pattern for the tetrahedron that we just folded. Yeah. Okay, two of these. So I'm just going to finish this off. So this is the pattern for what we just folded. And you can see how this is different. See, now here we've got black center on white, white center on black. So we've, you know, the the only difference is where we're looking at it from, one side or the other. It hasn't changed. We can fold that up to the tetrahedron. And you can see now that one is black and three are white. Or we can do it the other way and get the other. Well, so now we've got three black and one white. And we have a center. We know where the center of the circle is. There's a lot of information that we're not going to go into. I just want you to know that this is a very different than this. The beauty is that both of these that are so separate and different in their creases come together in the octave. They're both here. And yet they separate out in very different ways. You can see this has a black cent- a black tent triangle center. 
It still has the center to the circle, but it's not what you register, it's not what you read. Here you read a center of the circle where it's triangles come together. So they read differently, but they're the same grid. And this tells us that they are both the same grid because they're both in there. So um, you've got two of these guys. Yeah. Um, can you put them together? Uh, no. The first one is not as good anyway. Yeah. On. But that, that, that's one way. Yeah. Yeah. That's another way. Well, any way you put them together is kind of the same. Well, kind of. So in opening it up like this. Yeah. If you open it up so that it's, there's, there's, it's equal. Yeah. The, all the triangles are equal. The, the solid oh, ones yes, and the yes, open yes, ones. Yes, yes, you got you got it. Yeah. Wow. See, that, that gives it a nice balance and equilibrium that you know in any other it doesn't have. Wow. It's it's back to symmetry. The first thing the first circle does is it gives us symmetry. So all the way through, symmetry is going to be there or not, depending on whether we see it or not but it will be there. So if you put two of these together, yeah, put one into the other. Yeah. Okay, good. There's a name for that figure. That's the second of the platonic solids, the octahedron. The octahedron. And this is where, where the classifications fall apart. They're not as logical as, as we think they are. You have start with the tetrahedron, and then you have the octahedron, which you're holding. Right? Then you have the icosahedron, dodecahedron, and the cube. Yeah. Well, this, what you're holding with the octahedron is a truncated tetrahedron. So why isn't the octahedron part of the semi-regular truncated figures? It belongs there, but it is never put there. Because we are going by a system that we have decided is logical. And right. That, that determines the classifications. And the classifications leave out this beautiful interchange between the two. Wow. This is extraordinary because it gives us this. This can also be done in this form, which is very different. It's exactly yeah. the same thing, except one tetrahedron has been kept in a tetrahedron form, but it's been placed inside the same relationship. We can, oh. to do something here. Okay. The, um, oh, you can do something too. Take these two, you know, you've got your octahedron. Take it apart and keep the other one where, where the other one joined. Just keep together and then open it. See if you can open them. You're opening the other one over here. And yep. they're going to be joined by just a single half edge length. So you've got some tape, I saw. So yeah. tape those together. Just on the on the half edge. Um yes. Yeah. Tape together on the half edge. OK. 
Okay. This is a bit of an approximation, but <laughs> yeah. Okay. Approximation. <laughs> The circle is not an approximate. No, no, my, my, my work is... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, approximation is good. That's where we start. So you got those taped together? Yep. Okay. Fold it back up into a octahedron. Okay. So you can see what, what we've traditionally done is we've taken this octahedron yeah. that we have constructed by putting eight triangles together traditionally. Here we're just two folded circles put together, get an octahedron. Traditionally, what we do is we want to see all those eight triangles at the same time for whatever reason we need to think we need to do that. So we open it up. It does not very really good. We open it up and we get the net, the net. The traditional net of the octahedron. Yeah. And so we can fold that back up. Now, the net, the, the tetrahedron, the tetrahedron pattern, and this is not the circle pattern as much as the tetrahedron, using that as the pattern or the prototype is one triangle in the middle and one off of each side, right? So here we have one triangle in the middle one off of that side, but we're missing one here and here mm. to complete the pattern. This is an incomplete pattern. And all we've done is instead of this, we've slid it over halfway. Wow. That's all we did. And that, that relationship, proportional relationship, is already inherent in the folds. We didn't have to construct anything. We just had to pay attention to what's there. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't have one of these made. Not to worry. Prior to our getting together, but I didn't think we were going to go here. But it, see, and now if we were together, we could take yours and mine and put them together to make a full tetrahedron pattern. of the octahedron. Four two frequency triangles, one in the middle and one half off of each side. We did that all the way around. We would then have a tetrahedron pattern, but with a lot more information and we fold that up and that gives us the icosahedron. Yes. Which has nothing to do with tetrahedron traditionally. But it gives us the alcosahedron. Yes. Um, I don't. Don't worry. I don't have one of those. With, on with twenty, with twenty edges, yes. So anyway, that that's how it. You can't just say, "Okay, this is a net." End of story. I can make an octahedron. No, this is a net. It's not end of the story. Complete the pattern. Then you go into the icosahedron, and then there are. Many, many variations on that that we don't recognize because we've made a separation between all these separate parts. Um, I will do one thing here. But you could do this too. Fold or tape three, three congruent sides together uh, so that half of your octahedron is taped together. The 
You mean go back to the octahedron? Yeah. Back in the octahedron, you've got your two edges taped, taped two more edges, right, on either side of those. So they're... Okay. Two. One, two, three. So you're just taping three together and three are left over. Okay. So yeah, this is a reflection of that ratio of one to two. We have an octahedron. So we have we have six sides, I mean six edges. Yeah. We tape three of them and leave three of them open. That's one to two. And all of a sudden we can take the octahedron. We can open it up. And we get the three six symmetry. We found now five ten. How does that happen? It's just if we open it up all the way around, we now have one, two, three, four tetrahedron. One is inside we don't see, the other three we see. We actually have more than that. We have five because we have one, two, three, four. We have a very open tetrahedron. Yes. Two sides, two planes closed, two planes open. So this is the the uh, the cell, the single cell for the tetrahelix, which is the basis for the DNA double helix. Inside of each one of the, I really didn't go into this. Um, you're wondering about how that happens. This is a two frequency tetrahedron. Each one edge length is two. This is a one frequency tetrahedron. It's just one edge length, single measure. This does not happen spherically. This is a concept that we have created and call a solid. <clears throat> we project, this is a sphere, this is a sphere, this is a sphere. This four spheres, we put them together in the closest packing of spheres. And this is what we get connecting centers. Mm -hmm. Assuming they have a center, a fixed center. This is a two frequency. This is spherically what happens. You've got one sphere, two, three, four. They have these points of connection and, and these, these six points of connection are the octahedron, which we just made a solid of. But that's that space in there, that's an octahedron. Now you can see that from, from the six points of the octahedron, I've shown a, a line between opposite points, so I don't know whether you can see that, but yes. that gives that gives me three axes to the octahedron. Yes. yes. You see the one that's the two that are green. If you put a whole bunch of these together in an octahedron in a tetrahelix, open with this two frequency tetrahedron, and look at those axial divisions. All the greens would form the DNA double helix. It's there. And it's modelable. Now, <clears throat> taking us back into history a little bit, when when when, um, when they discovered the, the DNA model, that took a lot of, of messing around geometrically to figure out how to put those individual pieces together. And yet here they are already together. And you can model them. 
but you can't do it from a classical or traditional perspective because you're working with pieces. Yeah. This is just four circles. <laughs> a little bit of string. <laughs> um, a child can do this. Why did it take them so long to figure out the DNA? One, because they were looking at the whole chemical kind of structure um, from a very limited chemistry point of view, because chemistry was not geometry, was not math, was yeah. not art, was not, it was by itself. And it took them a long time to make just a few connections to be able to say, oh, this is there. We still don't describe it this way because we have a computer to take care of all the complex concepts that we've patched together that we call a DNA double helix. And now the further into that helix we go, we're finding it's not a helix at all. It's a form of relationship that transfers information. So it's about relationship. And the only reason for relationship is the, the sharing, the giving, the transforming, the giving out, the taking in of information. And that's the first fold, touching two points. If they're not touching, there's no relationship. If there's no relationship, that circle is going to give you arbitrary information which has no meaning. Other than, well, we fold it in half, it's close enough. That doesn't cut it anymore. Not today. Because we've got technology that says, I can get closer than you can see, than you can feel, than you can think. And I can show you that the space around those atoms, we can't see what we assume are there, is no different than the space in the galaxies we're looking at outside of ourselves. Same space, what's going on? The only commonality is movement of relationship. And that's where that, that connection happens. Connection doesn't happen if you're, if you're missing. There's the connection. It goes both ways. That's what's missing between you and I right now. I can't, I can't touch you. I can't feel you. I don't really get a sense of who you are because it's not going back and forth. You don't know who I am. And that's what's being taken away by technology is the ability to touch one another either energetically or physically or psychically or intellectually. We cannot touch each other. So there's no back and forth of information. There is only this medium in between that is feeding each one of us one way. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's not about duality and that separation. And, you know, I control you is that when I touch you, we are in control of each other. Mm. And we have to pay attention. We have to be present to that. It's a different ball game. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I mean, this has been a... Tremendous conversation. Thank you for initiating us into the mysteries of geometry and the sphere. And uh... Uh, now, now be be before <laughs> before you go further, I call what I do whole movement, not geometry. Geometry means measure Earth measure, measuring things of the Earth. <clears throat> We are far beyond measuring things of this Earth. We are measuring galaxies and systems that we didn't know existed two years ago. So what is this measuring Earth? We're talking about the whole, Absolutely. comprehensively, inclusively, unity. And there's no way to measure that. 
but we do see it move. So we're into whole movement. Movement of the whole is what we need to understand and focus our attention on. Because then we see how the parts <clears throat> are arranged, are ordered, are generated into separate individual systems that work. I mean, there's no system that is whole within itself. Every system gives to that which is less than itself, and it takes from that which is more. That's what a system is. It's, it's an in-between place. It's the music that happens between this note and that note, and it brings them together in ways that are harmonious, that work, that generate, that move forward. So anyway, I'm just... Think of, think of this as whole movement, not geometry. Geometry is 2D thinking, and we're too much involved in that. Mm -hmm. We need to change our language to describe our experience, which is no longer 2D, mm -hmm. and it's no longer 3D, because 3D is measuring objects that don't move. And we're in a context of unity that is in constant motion. <laughs> so anyway, this has been fun. I've, oh, fantastic. It's amazing. I've enjoyed uh, the, um, the virtual person I'm talking to. <laughs> wonderful, 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 wonderful. Thanks so much. Microphone. Any, microphone any, keeps falling down. Any, anything you want to say to, to the educators or to the audience that was listening out there? Any, any last uh, sort of remarks? All I can say is we need to educate, re educate ourselves to the present and not the past. The past does not hold a solution, the future doesn't even hold a solution, it holds the presence. Hmm. You know, and if we're not attending to that, then we are trying, we are playing catch up with the past and that'll never happen. We don't know where we're going. We don't see what we don't see. We don't know what we know until we know it. And the only way to know it is to pay attention, to observe, to be there. So I'm not, the, the game is, I mean, it's unknown. Right now, today, the future is not predictable by any matter of means. No statistics, no, you know, none of that is going to tell us where we're going. Where we're going is going to be an agreement upon what we do. And if we're doing it, we better pay attention because we haven't done so good so far. In that sense, there are no last words. They're just what I have to say at the moment. Of course, of course, of course. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, your, for, for, for your time and for... Thank you, uh, Terrace. This, is, this, is, this has been fun. Yeah. And uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you.